Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Ross Virginia. I'm a member of the Environmental Studies Program, and I'm also the director of the Dickey Center's Institute for Arctic Studies. And today's seminar is sponsored by Arctic Studies, and it's also sponsored by the Igert Polar Environmental Change Graduate Program. This is a contribution to a series we call Dialogues in Polar Science, Engineering, and Society. Um, it, it's really a wonderful opportunity for me personally to have someone here who's a friend and a colleague and a member of the Dartmouth community, and that's Dr. William Schlesinger. Um, Bill is internationally recognized as a leader in the fields of biogeochemistry and climate change. And he, he's built a career connecting ecology to the earth sciences in ways that creates new knowledge that's relevant to solving major environmental problems, problems such as desertification, nitrogen pollution, and human perturbation of the carbon cycle. And Bill's going to be talking about these issues today. What are the new challenges and new perspectives around biogeochemistry? So if you don't know what biogeochemistry is yet, you will by the end of this talk, I can assure <laughs> you. Um, Bill is a member of Dartmouth's class of 1972. And that was a really special time at Dartmouth. It's a time at which ecosystem science was really becoming a science. It was a time when ecologists were beginning to actually work together and talk to earth scientists around understanding how the environment works. And there were a lot of really great people at Dartmouth at that time that influenced Bill and he's carried forward with that work. Um, Borman, Likens, Johnson, Drake, there's other people in the room here, Dick Holmes, and others that really had an influence on Bill in the evolution of this science. And so, what you're going to see today, in part, I think, is a legacy of, of some of the things that Dartmouth has put forth and some of the good work that Bill has done is truly inspired by the faculty that he met here. Um, at Dartmouth, Bill was a, a leader in the environmental movement at the time. Um, there was the Environmental Studies Division of the Dartmouth Outing Club. And the very first Earth Day was 1970, right? So Bill was a student here. He's one of the principal organizers of Earth Day events at Dartmouth College. And so I tried to find out a little bit more on that, and I ran out of time today, but uh, you have an assignment. If you go to the Rahner Library, Special Collections Library, um, there's a collection around the, the Dartmouth Outing Club. And if you pull box 6172, <laughs> there's a hanging folder in there, and the title is William Schlesinger, Articles and Brochure, Circa 1971-72. <laughs> now, Bill, I have no idea what's in there, if there's anything incriminating or not, but um, Bill's history is, is logged and is recorded in Rahner. So from, from Dartmouth, Bill went on, um, stimulated by his interest in ecology and biogeochemistry, to Cornell. He got his PhD there, and he took his first faculty position at UC Santa Barbara. He was there for not too long. I think we learned last night that his sort of Ivy Tweed didn't fit in too well with the beach scene at Santa Barbara. And so he, he, came, he came east again. He came to Duke. And he spent 25 plus years at Duke as a faculty member and then eventually becoming dean of the School of the Environment, which, as most of us know, is, is one of the premier programs in ecology and, and, and environmental science in the world. And there at Duke, Bill developed several lines of research that are really, I think, the, the hallmarks of his work. Um, one line was around arid lands and the process of desertification and how humans interact with vegetation and soils in ways that accelerate change, change degrade ecosystems, and lessen the ecosystem services that they provide to people. He also became involved in a leader in a very innovative experimental approach to release CO2 into the free atmosphere and look at the response of entire communities to elevated CO2. This was a major technological and scientific breakthrough and Bill was a, a major player in this, this type of work. And all through this was another, the passion of Bill is, and we, we share this, is he loves soil. He likes to dig holes and to collect things and analyze them. And Bill's been really, really a leader in understanding how soils influence the composition of the atmosphere. And this is becoming more and more a critical problem for the future, particularly with warming in the Arctic regions. Um, in 2007, Bill left Duke to come east, or left Duke to come north, to the Institute, the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Um, the Cary is a, a not-for-profit private research center and institute. Um, it is a world center for ecosystem science, and it has been for quite a long time now. They have a 30-year history of doing this. And the Cary is, is known for its uh, basic research, 
used to solve applied problems. And the carry provides information. It's an honest broker, provides information for decision makers and policy makers around issues such as clean water, air pollution. And more recently, I think some really neat work's coming out on, on the role of climate change and its impact on disease in the Northeast. One of the things that Bill has championed at Cary is he's greatly expanded their, um, their public outreach and their public education and their science education programs. And if you track Bill's career, you'll see that he's done this in a lot of different ways. Um, he's been a frequent testifier to Congress on climate change related issues. He's given testimony in various court cases. He's worked with the, the Natural Resource Defense Council and others that work hard to protect the environment. And that's always been a big part of Bill's career. Um, his work has been recognized in many, many different ways. He's past president of the Ecological Society of America. He's a fellow of, uh, of uh, GSA, Geological Society of America, uh, Trip. AAAS, the American Association of, for the Advancement of Sciences. And in 2003, he achieved really the highest honor that we can give to a scientist. He was elected as a member of the National Academy of Sciences. So Bill is, uh, from his days here in organizing Earth Day, has done good. He's gone out into the world and he's advanced science, but he's also advanced the interface between science, education, and policy. So we have to thank him for that. Now, his, um, the last thing I want to mention is, Anyone who's been on a, a, one of my graduate committees, I'm always handing them Bill's book for their oral exams. And he, he has the book. It's called um, Biogeochemistry and Analysis of Global Change. It was published in the late 90s. And it, it's been the standard for educating students and, and young scientists about this particular field. Um, I learned last night that the third edition is coming out in January, completely rewritten. Um, um, I wasn't paid to plug this book, um, <laughs> but please pick up a copy. Um, all my students are it'll be required reading. It'll be out in January. But Bill continues to freshen and lead in this synthesis between biogeochemistry and climate change. So um, Bill's presentation is up here today. It's uh, New Perspectives on Biogeochemical Cycles. So please join me in a very warm welcome for Bill Schlesinger. Thank you. I think this is working. It's great to be back. I've known Ross for a long time, and that was a wonderful introduction, and wonderfully you stayed off the stories of being in the field together and such things. Um, as Russ said, I, I, you know, I have a real uh, fond spot for Dartmouth College. For me, my uh, entering, I was a bird watcher when I arrived here, but uh, entering the field of biogeochemistry really happened on the second floor of Gilman which I sadly hear is going to be torn down or something now. That's going to be painful. But uh, it was uh, working in uh, Bill Reiner's lab, um, and he really convinced me that, uh, in fact, uh, there was a career other than medicine, uh, that uh, one could make a living, have a good time, make a, make a difference uh, to society being a biogeochemist, um, and kind of the rest is history. I really caught that, uh, caught that and took that to heart. Um, and have done it now for 40 years or something. So it's a, that's a little scary. That's why you're getting this kind of philosophical uh, title today. Um, that said, I would like to argue, and I'd like to have you uh, come out of what I'm about to say today uh, with the feeling that this subject of biogeochemistry, which I call the chemistry of the surface of the earth, uh, recognizing that biology has such an imprint on that uh, that as much as my geochemical colleagues would like uh, to have pure geochemistry, if you're dealing with the surface of the earth, uh, you're really dealing with biogeochemistry. If you want to study the mantle, then you can be a, a, a pure geochemist. Um, and beyond that, so many of our environmental problems today, nationally and around the world, uh, deal with changes in the chemistry of our planet that affect biology and feedback on climate in ways that we're worried about. I think we should be very worried about, uh, but in ways in which an understanding of the Earth's chemistry is absolutely essential. Uh, it's provided by science. Uh, it needs to be delivered to policymakers who hopefully we can uh, entrain to listen to us, uh, and hopefully we can get them uh, to, uh, use, uh, to understand what we're saying and to use uh, some of our science as they formulate responses to, to climate change and nitrogen pollution and, 
and the like. Uh, so I'm going to argue that uh, biogeochemistry is not, uh, does not embrace perhaps all of ecology, but it underpins a huge amount of what we're currently seeing uh, happening to our natural systems today. Okay, um, that said, I want to uh, give you uh, a little bit of uh, uh, retrospective, at least on how I think about biogeochemistry, and uh, hopefully some tools. Those I know there's a lot of students here that are uh, interested in this field or interested in incorporating this field interdisciplinarily with what they're doing. Um, and uh, so I want to give you a perspective on some, you know, just some ways in which over the years I have thought about this field and found um, the useful uh, to progress there. And the first is to say uh, that uh, if you're dealing with policymakers, uh, the media, students, uh, or, your, or your disbelieving colleagues, uh, that if you're a biogeochemist, it doesn't do any harm to put together a cartoon for how the world is working with your particular element. Could be nitrogen, could be sulfur, could be phosphorus. Uh, I had a student do this uh, for the boron cycle uh, a few years ago. Um, and it, you know, the individual cycle is not uh, my point here. My point is that you see biology here. Boron is cycling on land and in forests uh, that take up boron as a trace element every year. Uh, and use it biochemically. It's also cycling in the marine biology. Uh, there's also a release of boron, in this case, from rock weathering, and it flows to the ocean and river flow. Uh, boron returns to the land surface uh, by movements through the atmosphere. And all of this is something that a policymaker can get a hold of. You know, even, the, even the most disbelieving uh, of that can see uh, that you've got some natural flows here, and then you've got this thing labeled industrial activity, and they get some idea of the comparison between the two, and you can talk to them about that, and it gives you a, a common basis of, of communication. I would also say that it's really useful if you, you know, you've been very carefully, uh, you know, maybe in Antarctica, measuring the flux of something out of the soil, and you've got, got this down to three decimal points per square meter of what the annual flux of nitrous oxide is coming out of the soil, uh, that it's useful to stand back from your field measurements, your primary data, and actually say, well, if that's true, uh, how does it fit into the global cycle for nitrogen? Does it make sense uh, on that? Uh, and if it doesn't, then you've got two possibilities. Either you've discovered something really uh, hot, or you might want to check your math. Um, and uh, both of those are worth pursuing. So with these kinds of cartoons, I think it's interesting uh, to see uh, the effect of the biosphere on the surface of the Earth. I've taken a bunch of major elements here uh, that are important to us. Uh, most, but not all of them, are essential to life. Mercury's kind of an exception in that uh, role. Uh, this is the flux in and out of the biosphere uh, every year. That number is in 10 to the 12 grams per year. That probably uh, is not a, the point of this particular slide, except you can calculate uh, the net primary production of the wor world's land and ocean uh, plants and uh, calculate how much carbon they take out of the abiotic environment and fix into plant tissue every year. Now, the important thing is if you compare that to the sedimentary flux of materials on the surface of the Earth, which in this case includes the reaction of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere with rocks and the flow of bicarbonate to the ocean uh, in river flow. So you can sort of compare how much is the biosphere cycling and how much is moving and would move presumably on an abiotic earth uh, with no life. And that's what this uh, comparison over here, I simply took the cartoons like that you just saw for boron uh, and uh, pulled the number for biology of biological cycling off of it and pulled the number for sedimentary flux off of it. And this really gives you a feeling for you know, this is the bio and biogeochemistry. Life on Earth is dominant, hundreds of times more effective at cycling carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus uh, than the sedimentary cycle. It's important for sulfur, uh, calcium, iron. It's interestingly important for copper. Copper's uh, kind of a strange, uh, uh, you know, it's not as much as uh, carbon, but it's uh, surprisingly high. And then you look at an element like chloride, chlorine, uh, and you see it less than, uh, less than one fraction there. Uh, and chlorine, sort of our, uh, I used to call it our dud element, our conservative element. It's something that really life isn't terribly interested in in large quantities. Uh, and so it's mostly flowing in the sedimentary cycle uh, as it would on a lifeless earth. Um, so I would look at this and say, you know, this is, a, this is a prime evidence of 
the role of biology, why we have a biogeochemistry at the surface of the Earth. Okay, now with that said, we can look at another uh, aspect of this. Here's the same biospheric flux column here, uh, but uh, in addition to that, I've now got this calculation of the anthropogenic flux to the surface. That's the burning of fossil fuels. That's the extent that you and me and all of our activities that use coal, oil, and natural gas uh, dig up and dig into the crust of the earth and bring up carbon that would otherwise weather very slowly geologically. We bring it up and oxidize it and get it into the surface cycle. For nitrogen, it's the fixation of nitrogen N2 gas from the atmosphere into nitrogen fertilizer, uh, purposely for the production of fertilizer and explosives. For phosphorus, it's mining. For sulfur, it's actually mostly the inadvertent release in the burning of coal and uh, other sulfur-containing fluids, uh, fuels. Um, and so those are the anthropogenic fluxes, and this is a, an interesting ratio of anthropogenic to sedimentary. Uh, this is how much one species, not all of the biosphere as in the previous slide, but how much one species, namely Homo sapiens, has changed uh, the flux at the, at the surface of the Earth. And you can see for carbon and phosphorus, uh, and nitrogen, actually, the, the, the uh, contribution is considerable. And of course, our concern with climate change is all revolves around the fact that the anthropogenic uh, impact on digging up the crust of the earth and putting carbon in the atmosphere is some 36 times faster than that would happen uh, naturally um, in, uh, in a life, well, in a world without, you know, it's kind of like that book, The World Without Us. That's, that, that, that's this column. This is. This is uh, the difference between a world without us and a world with us. Um, and this last column is, this is really Homo sapiens uh, versus all the rest of the biosphere. Um, and uh, so we, we're cycling about 8% of the carbon on the surface of the Earth right now. All of the basis of our, our concern about climate change is based on the fact that one species, namely Homo sapiens, is now putting into the atmosphere, uh, I guess advertently, uh, 8% more carbon dioxide than we get there every year uh, on, a, on a planet without us. And you can see the perturbations of all these cycles. Uh, mercury is, uh, you know, quite, that, that leaps out here. And of course, there's been a lot of work on mercury at Dartmouth, and uh, that's, the, that's the concern uh, for it there. So I look at those, uh, my, I guess my first message of the day today um, is that if you're a biogeochemist and you want to participate in the policy arena or have an effect on uh, envir the environmental Im improvement of environment. The cartoons are useful and that you can extract really interesting stuff out of those global pictures, uh, such as in these slides about the human impact and the impact of life uh, and move forth uh, in that way. They're also not bad if you're going back to your grandmother and who wants to know what this field of biogeochemistry is and you know you can use the cartoon to explain it. Okay, so I want to go into three uh, points of view that illustrate things that I have found useful as a biogeochemist over the years. And all, all of these, I'll give you some examples of how they've been useful. And the first of these is the recognition that there's really a basic stoichiometry of life uh, as seen as in biomass. And it goes back uh, into the 1800s. Uh, Robert Redfield, uh, looking at Redfield ratios in the ocean, certainly well, he got a name, uh, a, a ratio named after him for uh, recognizing that. Bill Reiners, uh, uh, shortly after he left Dartmouth, actually has a huge contribution I'll show in a minute. Sterner and Elser uh, have really been the ones that have articulated this uh, the most broadly in the last few years. So what do we mean by the, the uh, biogeochemistry of life? I think uh, Reiners' paper here in 86 is one of the best examples of that. And what Bill gathered from the literature was basically the bulk living tissue composition of various uh, uh, taxa, bacteria, down here to mammals. Uh, there's plants mixed in here. Uh, all these are ratioed against phosphorus, so that if there was phosphorus here, there'd be a one uh, in every, every slot in that column. And this is the amount of carbon per unit phosphorus. Uh, uh, and in uh, angiosperms, here's uh, carbon, uh, hydrogen, uh, nitrogen per unit phosphorus. And he found that there were fairly predictable ratios that differed between taxa depending on whether they were cellulose or uh, living uh, animal tissue and whether it was animal tissue if it had a lot of bone or whether it was mostly protein. Uh, but you could extract fairly predictable ratios uh, from those data. Now why 
uh, is this kind of thing useful? Let me give you a hands-on example. Right now, human beings are adding a whole lot of nitrogen to the, this is a picture of the global nitrogen cycle. A whole lot of nitrogen is being added to that cycle on land. It's cycling, it's always been, plants have always been taking up nitrogen and incorporating in tissues and dropping it to the uh, surface at the end of the year. Uh, nitrogen's always been arriving in biological fixation. Uh, but humans have roughly doubled the amount of nitrogen available on the land surface by our production of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, and it, it's a huge industry, it's worldwide now, uh, and is destined to increase as the world's population goes from seven to 10 billion in the next uh, four decades or so. And so we can ask you, you know, what happens to that? And one of the things that's been postulated as happening to that is that it fertilizes inadvertently parts of the biosphere where it is not spread, in other words, not, it gets away from the farm fields where you put it, and lands in other places where it stimulates the growth of plants. And a number of policymakers have, have latched onto that and said, that's great, you know, we got all this fertilizer being used in farm fields, it's gonna get to other places, it will stimulate the growth of plants in those other places, they'll take up carbon and solve the climate problem for us. Uh, and so you can think, how, how uh, you know, what's the basis of that? I'm going to argue that uh, some stoichiometry needs to be brought to bear on those cards, kinds of arguments. So many of you have probably seen some of these uh, maps. These are gathered by the National Atmospheric Deposition Program of the concentration, in this case, of ammonium uh, in rain falling in the U.S. And you can see that it's highest out here in the, so here's a scale of low to high. Uh, highest out here in the Great Plains where a lot of ammonia and urea uh, fertilizer is being used and that volatilizes out of the, out of the soils. Uh, and uh, when rain falls in those areas, it has a big concentration of ammonia. So that's almost as, uh, like having a map of where fertilizer is used. And you can see that the concentrations in the eastern U.S. are, are much lower. Then you can ask, okay, where, what's the deposition of ammonia? And of course, you still see a big concentration out here in the Midwest, but basically, as you go back and forth between these two, you can see that that cloud of ammonia has moved east and rained out where uh, it had no intention of being distributed. Um, and sometimes that amounts to about 30% of the fertilizer that's used in Midwestern cornfields and the like uh, gets away, moves east, rains out on places like the Cary Institute, uh, and stimulates the growth of forests there. This has been used uh, or noticed uh, widely in Europe as well as the U.S. Um, it's been noticed by lots of people other than me. I have dabbled in various parts of this, but it's uh, uh, been fairly widely uh, uh, part, uh, anticipated that this might stimulate the growth of plants and take up some carbon. Now, I want to give you an example of where stoichiometry could have been brought to bear on this problem. I'll pick on some Europeans today because we're now comfortably in New Hampshire, and there may, no be, may not be any of the co-authors of this paper uh, in the room. But what they note is that if you look at nitrogen deposition over forests in Europe, so this was the amount falling from the atmosphere, and this was the amount of plant growth that was, was seen in those forests and tons of carbon per hectare per year, that there was this wonderful relationship, uh, uh, almost textbook. In fact, I, I used to long for graduate students that would bring me 0.97 R squared uh, to things. So not much response when you have low amount of nitrogen uh, falling from the atmosphere. And then nearly a linear response as you added more and more nitrogen. The problem, and where stoichiometry should have been brought to bear on this, is the slope of that line is about 500. 500 carbons per unit nitrogen. And that's way in excess. It's about 10 times higher than any value in Bill Reiner's or or any other table uh, for the C to N ratio in plant tissue. And so very early on, these workers, as I say, if you find something that differs uh, strongly uh, from uh, published compilations of things, you got two possibilities. Either, you, either you're really onto something or uh, you should check the math. Um, and this paper was resoundingly criticized for ig uh, ignoring the fact that that stoichiometry was just incompatible with anything we knew about a plant. Be nice if plants started 500 carbons to a nitrogen, we might have a policy option for climate change in that uh, thing. But it, you know, it just, it should have uh, had some stoichiometric uh, principles brought to bear on it. Unfortunately, it didn't. It got uh, resoundingly uh, criticized in nature and global change biology. Um, and we've now moved on and uh, what Christy Goodale and uh, uh, 
Thomas. Quinn Thomas used to be a student here a couple of years ago. That's his name, Quinn Thomas. Uh, just published a paper that I think brings more rational uh, numbers uh, to uh, the carbon sink that is anticipated from nitrogen uh, deposition, at least in the U.S., uh, with, a, with a C to N ratio, I think, 45, you know, something that could be believable. Okay, second, second principle of this. Um, I think biogeochemists uh, need to remember uh, some of the things about oxidation reduction reactions that you learn in intro chemistry and uh, intro microbiology. Uh, various players have been at this uh, for a number of years. Paul Falkowski is uh, one of my current favorites of uh, an articulate uh, promoter of the importance of realizing that it's not just the content of biomass, which is a little bit static, but you can use the fact that electrons are being transferred in oxidation and reduction reactions uh, to make some predictions about how biogeochemical cycles ought to behave. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Um, this is actually out of, out of the old edition of the book. I, Ross neglected to say that uh, when the new one comes out, all of you need one for work and one for home, actually. But, uh, but anyhow, in there you'll find a table like this of oxidation reduction reactions that talk about uh, each of these is coupled to the uh, oxidation of carbon. So oxi you can do that by uh, aerobic respiration. You can do it by nitrate respiration, which we call denitrification. And that these default downward uh, as the system gets more and more anaerobic. Um, and so you can look at the redox potential there where you expect these to kick in. These are the kinds of things that Roger Soderberg, you know, taught me 40 years ago in uh, intro, intro chemistry. Um, and uh, so there they are. Um, and uh, that's all transfers of electrons. In other words, you can really early on say you can't have denitrification uh, where you're producing N2 gas. Uh, unless it's coupled to uh, an equivalent amount of oxidation of carbon. And so what I did a few years ago is to put these together in a, in a chart uh, where across the top, these are things that are moving from oxidized form, for instance, carbon, uh, is, uh, that, that column is where carbon is moving from an oxidized form like CO2 in the atmosphere to a reduced form, which would be the carbon in cellulose. And so photosynthesis uh, falls in that box. Um, and over here, these are things that are moving from reduced to oxidized form, uh, and respiration uh, is in that box. That's, uh, you and me are all in that box. It may not look that way, but we're taking carbon uh, in reduced form that we ate, and we're breathing out CO2. Uh, we're breathing in oxygen and exhaling and excreting uh, water. And you can put almost all the metallisms you can think about on that chart. I've now uh, expanded this a little bit and added <laughs> iron and manganese on this gets too complicated for a slide, but iron metabolism and manganese metabolism, and realize that they're uh, coupled here. Here's, here's some uh, critters uh, that uh, oxidize sulfur when they find it in reduced form in the environment and reduce nitrogen. They, you know, carbon is uh, sort of a peripheral part of their life. They use it for building tissue, but the energy reactions uh, are all a, a sulfur-nitrogen coupling. Uh, Jill McCookie, who I uh, found out last night is now left uh, Hello, Dartmouth, uh, po pointed out to, to uh, at least to a number of us that many of these are not single organisms that do the coupling, but they can be consortiums of organisms. Uh, here's one that's moving carbon uh, from one form to another, doing uh, coupling that with a redox reaction with sulfur uh, that is then connected to a redox reaction with iron. And Jill uh, quite nicely uh, showed that in a paper in Science a few years ago. So you can use these kinds of things, and I want to go back to the nitrogen cycle here in a minute as an example of a problem facing uh, policymakers, maybe slightly behind their concern with climate change right now, but it, I, I predict that nitrogen cycling will be the next carbon for us to think about here. Uh, again, we're adding a whole lot of nitrogen to the Earth's land surface. Some of it we may think is being taken up by land plants, and we can make an estimate of that. Uh, but I was particularly interested at this time uh, in what the change in the rate of denitrification might be globally. And the reason that that was of interest is that if microbes in wet anaerobic places were converting a lot of the nitrogen that got away from farm fields and places where it spread around back to N2, nitrogen gas in the atmosphere, then it's much less of a problem for environmental scientists and, and managers 
than the nitrate that runs to the ocean and causes hypoxia in coastal zones. So I was curious, uh, could we get a global estimate of denitrification uh, and see what percent of the nitrogen fertilizer added might be going off to the atmosphere uh, in any uh, given year? Well, uh, so here's the denitrification reaction. If you're like me, it's, it's good to have that refresher uh, in front of it. So these organisms are taking up uh, available carbon from the environment uh, and nitrate. Uh, they're doing it in anaerobic conditions uh, and producing N2. That's what a textbook of microbiology will tell you is going on, okay? The interesting thing is that along the way, it, they produce some intermediates, particularly nitrous oxide. Um, and they do that in a predictable ratio uh, to the amount of nitrogen that's moving through the pathway uh, as well. And so I looked at this and said, gee, we, we might be able to estimate. It's very hard to estimate uh, the denitrification rate anywhere because if you put a chamber down, you're trying to measure an increase in nitrogen under that chamber when the background is 78%. And if you put it down and fill it with argon or helium or something so that you might be able to see uh, the increase in nitrogen under there. Just the, sli the slightest leak uh, w will mess up your measurement because it's, it's leaking in from an atmosphere with 78%. So it's really tough to get a direct measurement of that. And I was interested, could we estimate the global rate of the change in denitrification indirectly by recognizing that the metabolism is connected to uh, N2O? Okay, so here's nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. It's been measured uh, for a long time. These are actually reasonably old data, but it, it's increasing the atmosphere. It has an oscillation that looks somewhat like the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, and uh, it's uh, increasing faster and has higher concentrations uh, in the northern hemisphere than the southern hemisphere uh, for reasons that have been speculated about all over the map. It's not because there's more Denisophis in the northern hemisphere. This is, this is in fact, laughing gas of, of the Denisoff. But, um, uh, but it, you know, there is this pattern. We have a good data set. Uh, for that. You can also find it in ice cores. Um, and as my token slide for the IGERT uh, Arctic program here today, I wanted to say something about ice. Uh, but uh, various people have drilled through Greenland and Antarctica, <laughs> taken cores, analyzed the bubbles of gas in those cores with depth, uh, and gotten, gotten a, a historical uh, sequence of entry in the atmosphere from that. Uh, fairly stable at about 290 parts per billion by volume for a long period of time. Uh, and then in the late 1800s, about the time we discovered nitrogen fertilizer, it began to increase uh, rather rapidly. Uh, and of course, you lose the top few uh, layers of ice there. But that's an increase of about four teragrams of nitrogen uh, per year uh, in the global atmosphere. Park that number in, your, in uh, the corner of your brain here for a second. We'll need, need to come back to that. And what I was thinking, OK, if we know the, world is, uh, the world's atmosphere is increasing at that rate, um, and we know something about a ratio of N2O to the total production of N2 plus N2O in denitrification. Could we back out an independent measure of the, the rise of uh, denitrification? So here we are. This is the math behind it, except I left a, there should be one line there. So it's the change in N2O in the atmosphere uh, divided by uh, the ratio of N2O to the total production and denitrification uh, globally. Um, and that ought to give you total de denitrification. Mathematicians might uh, rough me around the edges for being that simple about it, but we'll 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 operate that for the for the moment. Um, I have a this is part of being an administration is that you have trouble going into the lab very often. But one thing uh, that you can do easily is as an administrator, any of you that go on in this and become department chair or dean or whatever, remember that you can you can always run to the library um, and you know, spend the 15 minutes between appointments and, gra and grab a number out of the literature and compile a big uh, synthetic uh, table of, of data and, and try to make something of it. So that's where these came from. Uh, these are, uh, I, I can show you the full data set uh, if you wish, but these are average ratios with the standard error of the N2O to the total of the two gases, uh, the ratio and production in different soils, ag soils, Soils under upland, natural vegetation, wetlands. You'll see under wetlands, the denitrification reaction mostly goes all the way to N2. And so the percent, only about 8% comes off as N2O. Uh, in ag and upland soils, uh, you know, the textbooks say denitrification product is N2. But in some cases, more than, uh, you know, half or, uh, or more than half is coming off as N2O. And, 
uh, we were able to compile those uh, ratios together. Um, and uh, then I kind of calculated a weighted average. This is the denitrification on land and the ratio in ag soils, plus the denitrification estimated for wetlands and the ratio on wetlands. So the total for land and the weighted average of the two to make the equation balance. I asked you to remember four teragrams a minute ago. Okay, so we have this, this is the weighted average global production of N2O to the total of N2 plus N2O, uh, about 0.25%. Here's the rise in the atmosphere divided by the ratio uh, would suggest that about 17 teragrams uh, is the change, the human induced change in denitrification globally. Where does that fit? We're currently putting about 150 teragrams on the land surface. We've roughly doubled the normal biological input from nitrogen fixation. And I'm suggesting that about 17 teragrams are now, that, that's the, the delta, the human change in the denitrification rate on a background of about 100, okay? To me, that's relatively small. It means that there's a lot of potential for managing landscapes, particularly wetlands, and the runoff from farm fields to wetlands uh, to potentially increase denitrification and, uh, and increase the loss by that pathway as opposed to the losses in some of these other pathways like river flow and groundwater uh, that create problems for us. Uh, so it allowed us, again, using that coupling of biogeochemistry, not just in stoichiometry, but the coupling uh, in uh, the actual reactions, allowed us to make a measurement of something that would be very difficult, or I call it an estimate, let's call it an estimate, of something that would be very difficult to measure globally. Um, and uh, I put that out as the second of the tools to recommend uh, for all of you. Um, now, a third aspect of biogeochemical cycles is to not underestimate the pow power of, of chelation. And I'm not gonna give you an example of this in action, but I wanna give you an example of a couple places where Chelation, which I look at as a greater affinity for an element of the periodic table for organic matter than for water. Essentially, that's my uh, look at that. Um, and a couple of examples. Uh, here's a paper, it's quite old, 1978, out of the literature that looked at the mean residence time for elements in seawater uh, as, uh, well, uh, this, this is, uh, I, I got my uh, ordinate and obsessive reversed uh, mentally here. So, the vertical axis is the ratio of these elements in seawater uh, versus the ratio of the, the elemental content of sinking fecal pellets. I don't know who this guy was that gathered those data, uh, <laughs> but it, it's a, it produces a very nice regression. If you look at elements that are highly concentrated in fecal pellets uh, versus seawater, they have a relatively short resonance time uh, in seawater, iron and uh, is a good example of that. If you look at elements that are not uh, strongly adsorbed uh, to fecal pellets or otherwise contained in zooplankton fecal pellets like strontium, uh, they have a relatively long residence time in seawater. Uh, and so you can look at that and say the whole transport of things out of the surface ocean to the deep ocean and to sedimentation, a major driver of that is the affinity of these elements to a biological material, in this case a sinking fecal pellet, uh, that might have been produced in the surface. So I'm gonna pick on Andy Friedland here. I'm not pick on you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna laud your uh, work here. Here's uh, another example of chelation. Uh, of course, we had leaded gasoline. When I was at Dartmouth, uh, my undergraduate project in, with Bill Reiners was looking at lead in rainfall falling on Mount Mooselock, and uh, we had, we're in the era of leaded gasoline, so there was a lot of it. Andy's been studying uh, what happened to all that lead? Where did it accumulate in forests? And uh, have these forests been flushing uh, lead out ever since leaded gasoline uh, stopped being used? So here's the fractional loss of lead from forest floor. Andy, tell me if I get this right. Fra fractional loss of uh, lead from the forest floor is a function of O-horizon thickness, how much organic matter you got sitting on the ground. And forests that are flushing a lot of lead uh, have relatively low uh, content of uh, soil organic matter on the surface and ones that are maybe not flushed any lead at all, it's all chelated, absorbed in those organic layers. So you could make a policy relevant prediction, how long will it take lead to flush out of the system uh, based on understanding its, its uh, affinity to bind, absorb, or chelate to uh, organic compounds. So I'd put that out as a third uh, area uh, that biogeochemists uh, need to think about. 
Okay, I want to spend a little bit of time here uh, closing up at uh, looking at what we are calling more frequently geoengineering. I think this is something that policymakers are going to have to face. I'm not exactly comfortable with it myself because I think our track record of big planetary scale manipulations is poor. Um, and, the, and the things we might mess up are, uh, you know, they'll take a long time to repair and they may be very distant from where we thought we were having an effect. But, it's the, but these are out there, fertilizing the ocean, putting sulfate uh, aerosols in the stratosphere, you know, various other kinds of ways where we could, let me be blunt about it, where we could continue business as usual, burning fossil fuels, um, which makes, of course, policymakers happy, and solve the climate warming problem by making the planet more reflective or getting the ocean to take up the CO2. They have a lot of appeal to people that really don't want to make the tough decision, which is stop burning so much fossil fuel and move to alternatives and renewables. Uh, but we need, and biogeochemists need, this is a prime example of where we need to be at the table, come to the table, demand being at the table, however you want to do it. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, when I was at Duke, uh, Dick Barber, a colleague of mine down at the Duke Marine, Marine Lab, was uh, very much involved with the ocean iron fertilization project. Here he uh, took this picture off the back of their boat down in the southern ocean, and uh, just as winter was coming on, looks miserable. I don't know, Ross, you probably identify with that kind of cold uh, gray water. Um, but uh, anyhow, there they are. Here's, here's his result, you know, fertilized and unfertilized with iron, fertilized on the right. Uh, those are the kind of data that I can appreciate. Uh, but I suppose you could have cells per cubic centimeter uh, in there as well. Um, but I think, you know, here's a case where biogeochemists might uh, weigh in on that. And it's interesting to see what we conclude. Suppose we wanted to sequester a billion metric tons of carbon dioxide from Earth's atmosphere, where it might otherwise cause climate change, and store that in the ocean. What would it take? Okay, so that's our goal. Billion metric tons to get it into the ocean. Current marine net primary production, about 50 billion metric tons of carbon per year. That's the total photosynthesis of the world's oceans. That number is getting nicely refined from satellite measurements. They're I'd say that's plus or minus 10 right now, which is a whole lot better than when I uh, was growing up as a biogeochemist. Uh, that's in the surface waters. Uh, about 15% of that sinks to the deep ocean, which is where you want to get it if you're going to store carbon. So that's uh, 7.5 billion metric tons of carbon that has the potential to sink down through the uh, thermocline into the deep ocean. Um, and so if you are sinking at that kind of ratio and you want to store an extra billion metric tons, uh, you need to store, uh, you need to transfer about 7 billion metric tons. Uh, well, excuse me, you need to stimulate net primary production about 7 billion metric tons. That's the goal. Uh, so some basic stoichiometry, that's the amount of stimulation of net primary production. Here's the iron to carbon ratios that have been uh, measured in the lab and by field observations. Uh, that's the amount of iron presumably it would take at minimum uh, to pull, pull this off. Uh, and then you can say, well, gee, that's just a tiny fraction of the iron production globally. Maybe this looks pretty good. Uh, don't write down that Schlesinger promoted this uh, today. You know, there's all kinds of uh, all things that further need to be uh, considered there. How much, uh, how much CO2 is released mining even this amount of uh, iron uh, and taking it out and spreading it into the ocean? Um, you know, you might sink that much additional carbon to the deep sea, but you might in the process release uh, even more uh, CO2 to the atmosphere. And what are the other effects on the marine biosphere uh, that we don't appreciate here in terms of trophic level changes and the like? But my point is, is that here's some basic stoichiometry, again, iron to carbon ratio, that could be brought to bear, brought to, brought to the table in ways that I think are simple enough that policymakers uh, can understand it and maybe deal with it a little bit. Here's one I've messed with uh, more directly. I have d done a lot of work, as Russ uh, has said, in, on soils. Um, I now like other people to dig the holes for me, though. I, you know, that's uh, <laughs> one thing that happens with time. Uh, but uh, I want to take the same, second question. There's a lot of policymakers said, could we pay farmers to store carbon in the soil? 
And you know that might be uh, an attractive policy option to keep burning fossil fuels will store carbon in agricultural soil. So this is a calculation, again, to store a billion tons of carbon in agricultural soils by fertilizing them. Not unreasonable a thing. Current terrestrial net primary production on the land surface, very similar to the ocean surface, about 50 billion metric tons of carbon. That number is even uh, more refined. Uh, preservation ratio is actually less than in the ocean. It's about 8 tenths of 1% rather than 15. Um, and so to store an extra billion metric tons of carbon in soils would require more than doubling uh, terrestrial net primary production because you're storing so little of it. Uh, most of it decomposes. That uh, is the result of the effectiveness of aerobic decomposition by fungi and bacteria. So we'd have to go from 50 to 125 billion metric tons of uh, net primary production. Uh, let's say we're not skeptical at this point, and we continue with the calculation. So here's 125 billion metric tons of carbon. Typical carbon to nitrogen ratio in uh, plant matter, you could get that off of Reiner's' table, about one nitrogen to 50 carbons, um, requires 2.5 times 10 to the 15 grams of nitrogen as fertilizer uh, every year just to pull it off. And that much, uh, uh, that should be an N. Uh, th th we're moving that number down here. So 2.5 uh, times 10 to the 15 grams of nitrogen uh, multiplied by 0.857 grams of carbon released uh, as CO2 per uh, gram of nitrogen fertilizer produced means that you'd be releasing that much carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. Notice it's double what you set out to, uh, to, to sequester from the atmosphere. This is a case where biogeochemists, provided they hadn't made this typo in here, uh, could have had a very simple case uh, saying that uh, the nitrogen fertilizer in ag lands uh, maybe is not such a good uh, approach to that. So my message uh, today, or I guess there's been three or four of them, um, we have some tools, cartoons, stoichiometry, coupled biogeochemical reactions, appreciation of chelation. All, these are all ways in which we can help elucidate how elements move on the surface of the Earth. And we're moving a lot of them. And I said I think the, the majority of our environmental problems are going to have some aspect of biogeochemistry impinging on them. Uh, we've got geoengineering facing us. Um, I don't think there's a more ripe time for a young person to uh, think about a scientific field than right now if you have a propensity uh, to study this one. I've often said biogeochemistry has come of age uh, in that uh, process. Um, and I think it's also ripe for those of you that want to make that, you know, cross the threshold of doing really good science as scientists, uh, but delivering that to the people that are, it, I won't say they're demanding it, but they ought to be demanding it. And if they're not demanding it, we ought to deliver it to them whether they want it or not. Um, and that's going to be a fun arena for the next, uh, well, the foreseeable future. Um, Ross asked me to say a few philosophical words, of, you know, at this point. Um, that's some of them. Here's a few others for those of you that are uh, just beginning this field. I, uh, I, I would say that one of the premiums I've put on my scientific career is reading really widely. Um, finding a lot of ideas that we consider new are actually buried in the old literature. Um, and, and for me, the old literature starts before 1975 in the web of science. Um, and I, I'm just tickled when I find something you know, published in 1957 that has the has the gem of things we're talking about now because you can put that citation in your paper and it, you know, it makes it look like this is this wonderful scholarly um, review of things. But uh, so I would say read widely because a lot of things that we consider new are actually old um, and uh, there's a huge amount of literature out there uh, and it's of course a, a really uh, good place to get inspiration. The second one is that no matter what field you go into, there's a real premium on leaving a legacy of new primary measurements that you made. Um, you can't do it all by computer modeling, by meta-analysis of somebody else's data. Um, you know, measure something. Measure something that's never been measured before uh, and report that um, and, uh, and, and compare it to other things that might have been measured similarly in places. Um, and that leaves a legacy that will never go away. Uh, sure, the analytical techniques will change and presumably get better, but 
Um, nobody can erase that, uh, that contribution uh, to uh, what, you've, what you've done there. Um, third thing here, uh, I would say uh, if you're faced with a bunch of things to work on, you know, things that tear you in different directions, first of all, work on the thing that you think is uh, the most important. That's a no-brainer. The second thing is to, finish, is to work on the thing that's closest to being finished. And I don't know how many students I've had that have, have messed up on that one. You know, they'll have five projects, five half-finished manuscripts, and they can't decide which one to finish. And so they work on the one that's farthest from being finished, and as a result, nothing gets finished. Um, and so the thing to do is to work on the one that's closest to being finished and move it out, uh, and then start on, on the next one. Um, groups are fun. As I was talking to the, uh, the group I had lunch with today, uh, groups are fun, they can be productive, stimulating, uh, but when I look back on what I've done, I'm, I'm actually had the, great, the greatest personal satisfaction out of things where I said, gee, I, I measured that, uh, I analyzed that, I wrote that up, and um, you know, that's, uh, if, if you need that kind of personal satisfaction, realize that that's, a, that's probably a good way to get it. Um, and my last uh, message is that along the way, uh, I think you need to have some fun in all of this. If you're not having fun on it, I would suggest even that you pick a different field where you can have fun. Uh, life is too short to not have some fun doing what you're doing, and academics uh, maximally allows you to do that, um, and so why not? And uh, I would also argue that the, the work we do as biogeochemists is too important, and the time is, uh, for our results is uh, getting increasingly short. Um, and so you want to make sure that you're fun and productive and, and deliver uh, good things to what society needs from scientists um, and, uh, you know, move along. Uh, and if, if you're not doing that, you're not having fun and, and being productive and moving fast, then you probably ought to be doing something else. But the fun thing is uh, the one not to forget because a lot of people in the course of being a graduate student, it all seems like such a huge labor that, you know, the idea that grad school was fun. Uh, is often forgotten. I'm going to stop there. I'll be glad to take some questions. It's great to be back uh, and have had a chance to chat with uh, a number of people uh, during the course of the day. What a great building this is, too. I mean, I have a fondness for Gilman, but uh, I mean, <laughs> my God, this is just awesome. Um, so uh, anyhow, great to be back. Thanks for having me, Ron. Question, here we are. Yeah, uh, well you did a good job of closing the loop on uh, chemical fertilizers and how much of a big net contributor to uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere that actually is. Um, I understand organic fertilization, organic uh, soils are much better sequester of carbon than chemical fertilized soils. Have you done the loop for that and whether we get a net gain of so this is uh, manure. Oh, repeat the question. The question is whether organic fertilizers, manures presumably, um, are better at sequestering carbon in soils than uh, artificial fertilizers. Uh, and you're absolutely right. If you take a you know a pound of nitrogen delivered in manure and a pound of nitrogen delivered in uh, urea produced in a petrochemical plant, uh, the carbon you know, from the organic fertilizer. I mean, you're adding carbon to start with as part of the manure, so you start ahead of the game that way. However, remember, every, every cow poop has been through a cow, and a whole lot of carbon that, if it hadn't been eaten and passed through the car that would, a cow that would enter the soil got respired while it was in the cow. Okay, so I look at uh, using uh, organic fertilizers that's a good way to dispose of fertilizer. But you got to also include the carbon that was put into the atmosphere in cow respiration. And that pretty much levels the playing field. It, it uh, makes the inorganic fertilizer just about the same. We actually did some calculations of that a few years ago that I can uh, point you to. Surprised me, actually. Um, but I, you know, as I, as somebody uh, wrote a letter to science about it, and my response was, uh, you know, as long as cows are heterotrophic, they're not going to be great uh, sources of material to sequester carbon. 
Andy. Bill, twice now you've downplayed other greenhouse gases, and that answer right there, you didn't mention methane, oh, methane. which I thought you would, but my, and my Function question. Function time. Um, <laughs> we can go on about that. <laughs> my question is about um, N2O, which when you, you mentioned that denitrification is good, it can reduce nitrate in soil and nitrate in waterways, but you kind of downplayed the fact that N2O is the intermediate product of denitrification, hopefully getting to N2 gas. And yeah. lots of times it doesn't get all the way, and you end up with increases in N2O in the atmosphere, right. which is a potent greenhouse gas. So let me add a, a codicil on my statement here about uh, stimulating denitrification. You'd certainly want to do that in wetlands, where the, you have the maximum potential of the reaction being carried all the way to N2. If we do it in the kinds of habitats that produce a lot of N2O, then we're going to, the N2O is enormous greenhouse warming potential and will be problematic. So absolutely right, good point. Um, and uh, again, you know, our understanding of whether wetlands or uplands are better comes back to basic biogeochemistry of where, where, where the reaction goes most completely to N2. Uh, but absolutely right, and I could, you know, I could go on about methane too, but we'll spare you here a little bit. It's in the new edition of the book. <laughs> Other comments? Yes, way back there. Um, I appreciated that you were talking about conveying biogeochemical cycles to non-scientists and policymakers, and I wondered what advice you would give to early and mature scientists about how to enter that fray. How have you done that? Uh, you know, enter the fray of policy and bringing your science to policy. So question, we'll repeat this question. Uh, how, how is it, uh, if you're mid-career, early career scientist and you want to enter uh, an arena where you're contributing to policy and policymakers? So I think there's a variety of ways uh, to do that. Um, and the first thing is to, is to go public in local media op-eds in your newspaper uh, are, is a great way to start, and visits to some of the policymakers and decision makers at your local, state, and even House of Representatives level. Um, they will meet with you, and you can walk in the door and say, we're doing this interesting research at Dartmouth that's relevant to climate change, and you ought to know about what's going on in your district. And you know, so you can get you can get rolling on that. It, it requires sort of some momentum, uh, an op-ed in local newspaper. Most of the elected officials at all levels will read the local newspapers. They're usually looking for their name, but you know they'll they'll look for your editorial, um, and uh, say, well, gee, that person over at uh, you know biology at Dartmouth is uh, doing some interesting work that I didn't know about, and maybe they could be a witness or something. Um, so it requires a grassroots effort. Um, I've always found it fun to do that. And then once you get on a roll, it begins to come a little bit more easily if you know, people hear you at one thing and uh, talk about it among their friends, and, you know, provide you're good, you'll get more invitations and um, get on a roll about it. We were talking at lunch about whether this was a good or a bad thing to do, which is, a, of course, a Good question. Um, I don't think there is, for a moment, a substitute of public outreach and policy for good productive science. Okay, so the so the currency of the realm for me and for academics is is still publication um, and productive, uh, important, relevant science. Um, the public outreach, I would say, is. Uh, uh, in, it's uh, on top of that. It's something you do because you want to do it for society, and, and that's kind of fun, and I, I think you can get a rush uh, doing it. Um, you know, I've been to a bunch of congressional hearings. I have to admit, you walk into the room, and there's that table with the water pitchers and the microphones, and the elected people are sitting up you know, on high looking down at you and asking. That's a, you know, that's a rush, um, and the fact that you're there talking about your science is, makes it all the more fun more fun. Um, so that's kind of a rambling response, but uh, you know, go for it. And I think you'll find it rewarding too. And if you don't, you know, then go to the lab and do important, interesting things and nobody will complain. Other questions? Yes. 
So you mentioned uh, nitrogen as possibly being the next carbon. Um, and I was wondering how uh, you think that falls into maybe some other essential elements, and such as phosphorus, which have um, arguably kind of, uh, because of the speed of the cycling, and, uh, have could also be limiting and, and critical to the So nitrogen it seems to, as we make a lot of artificial nitrogen fertilizer and, and spread it around, and it, because nitrate is so soluble, it gets away in places and causes problems where we don't anticipate it. Um, phosphorus is an interesting case as well. Um, I would say the, the problem looming with phosphorus is global supply. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's not clear whether we won't run through the global supply in this century. And most of it is in Morocco. Overwhelming part is in Morocco, which means you've got the potential for another cartel uh, like OPEC that, uh, you know, it's bad enough to have control of energy, but there's some alternatives to oil. We don't like them and we don't use them very much. But phosphorus, you know, <laughs> that's in there, it's essential biochemistry. Um, and crop plants are not going to grow well without it. Uh, so if one country uh, has control of it, or we run out, either way, that's a huge problem. Um, I think uh, we're beginning to see the, and refine the biogeochemical cycle of mercury uh, much better than we had a few years ago. Um, and uh, we can appreciate what the human contribution of the mercury cycle and where that's going and what that's doing. Uh, there's a lot of aspects of that that scare me a little bit um, in terms of um, you know fish uh, consumption of it. Um, so uh, you know those, that's kind of rambling down through the periodic table. But there's other elements that are out there to, that we need to be concerned about, um, either from uh, adding too much to the environment or running out perspective. Copper is another one that is potentially in very short supply relative to use. Other comments? Yes. I'm missing something big here, but in the mayor's uh, table, it's <coughs> the ratio of all the elements to the phosphorus. Why? Uh, it was at lowest concentration, so all the other numbers were greater than one. Okay. He just yeah he just he just picked that as something that produced no fractions. Or no, no less than you know less than one fraction. Yeah, it's just convenient. You could have used silicon or something, or yeah, kind of a. Actually, in a lot of ways, I wished he had used silicon, but I wasn't in charge of that paper. Yes, back there. <laughs> you say that all of this kind of geoengineering, all of these ideas are scary. Um, do you think they're still worth? Are they worth considering and thinking about, or? Does that just seem like, you know, we're just going to screw everything up? <laughs> okay, so is geoengineering as scary as it worth considering? Um, you know, I, in a lot of ways, I don't think we have that choice. I think if we don't consider it, other people are going to consider it, and we need to, we need to be ready with, uh, to deliver the best science to help sort that out. So we may not have the luxury of that. Um, I don't find, I, I don't dismiss geoengineering right off hand. Um, you know, adding calcium to watersheds has cleaned up runoff waters in some lakes without uh, at least seeming to have dramatic negative effects on uh, some ecosystems. So, um, you know, I guess my response to that is they're, they're all worth talking about, but they all need to be evaluated with a full, full life cycle analysis of the costs and benefits. Uh, and uh, in many cases, at that point, you back off and say, let's do something else. Let's, uh, my, my voice is about shot, so well, let's... Uh, what I'd like to say is, uh, uh, you've inspired me, Bill. I'd like to offer the Schlesinger Prize to any graduate students, a free dinner, if you can publish something in the op-ed, Valley News, that relates to biogeochemistry. <laughs> I'll buy a dinner for you, so get out there, start thinking about how to connect your work and send those op-eds to the Valley News. And I want to thank Bill very much for, for a fantastic talk and for a great time at Darwin. Well, it's been, it's been fun. <laughs> Good to see you.